Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so this is our second citizen science talk of the semester, fall 2019. And uh, to kind of keep with a, 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 a diverse theme, I've invited Miss Dawn Brooks to tell us a little bit about the science of yoga, and not just any yoga, but the science of yin yoga. Um, I think a lot of folks have practiced yoga and know that there are effects on the body on, uh, as well as on the brain, especially any kind of physiology in the body. And it's taken us a long time to actually understand what's really going on physiologically when we practice yoga. And so um, I asked Dawn if she would not mind uh, sharing with us some of the science that she is familiar with to explain some of those effects. Um, that we seem to have when we practice yoga. And so I would like to bring Dawn up now. And so Dawn and I have been friends for quite a while, at least 10 years. At least, at least. yeah. Maybe, maybe 12 <laughs> or 15. She's one of my very first yoga teachers. Um, so I really appreciate you coming out tonight and sharing your wisdom with us. And I look forward to practicing a little more with you. It's been too long. Yes. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Carrie. So, um, you can see I am a registered nurse. I haven't practiced nursing per se for pay for, what do you think, five years or so? But I did practice for 30 years. So, um, And near the end of my nursing career, I decided I wanted to teach yoga. So now I am at the maximum credentialing for yoga. E, e stands for experienced. Registered yoga teacher, so that's with the Yoga Alliance 500. I probably have at least another 500 hours in continuing education, and experienced means over 1,000 hours. I probably have 5,000 hours of teaching. I've been teaching a long time. <laughs> so um, I'm a sciencey kind of person. You know, a lot of um, yoga practice can get a little bit woo woo sometimes, and I'm always the person that's like, are you sure? But that's how. Um, we, you want to hit the next one? That's how we develop curiosity. Like, I think a healthy way to approach almost anything is, a, is with a little bit of skepticism and interest. So um, ancient yogis, I'm sorry it's a little bit blurry. These ancient yogis are practicing ancient yoga poses. I love the um, levitation one. I think it's actually just a symbol of when we do these practices, we feel light. It's not actually that they came off the ground. But um, what tools did they have? I mean, this was two to 5,000 years ago when this first started. They had awareness, curiosity, desire. They could use their breath, their body, and time. Time both meaning they had to time to do it. They could practice over time. They could repeat experiments with the body several times. Repli get it? The replication of experiments. Ha uh -huh. <laughs> They had discernment. Um, they were able to look really closely at what was going on. So um, I guess we can move from that one. Um, also, you have all those tools, too. You still have all those tools today. We just have more tools. We have science tools. So yin yoga comes from yin-yang theory in Chinese medicine um, when yoga and Buddhism went to Japan and China. It combined with other practices they were doing there. So things are called something slightly different. So we're all familiar with this black chasing white diagram of yin-yang theory. Um, one important thing to remember about this is that there's no absolute, even within the strongest, or it actually makes it stronger, part of yang, there is yin, and vice versa. So it's not one better than the other. It's just how things uh, work together. So. One more. Yeah. So yin yoga is slanted toward the yin characteristics. So it is slower or still in nature. It is cool rather than heated, um, meaning we work with the cooler tissues of the body rather than the muscle. Um, compassionate, 
non-striving or pushing. We're staying with stability. We're not trying to go as far as the body can possibly go. We're staying where we still feel stable. It works connective tissue versus muscle, and we're going to get deeper into connective tissue in a minute. The focus is on the exhale. The exhale is the letting go breath, the surrender breath, and I'll get a little bit more into why that's important um, in a little bit also. Again, there's no absolute yin or yang, only in relation to something else. So this gentleman is in a very deeply forward folded posture that feels probably really great to him. <laughs> Um, not everyone's going to look like that. The thing about yin yoga also is it's not about any particular shape or alignment. It's about where you feel the sensation. So we're going for stretch in certain places in the body. So this pose would be stretch in the outer legs and hips. And of course, as you bend forward up the back of the body, back of the neck, uh, the connective tissue sheath for that area of the body runs from behind the toes all the way up the back of the body to your eyebrows or your brow. So um, if you were sitting up straight, you would still be folded in half. You'd still be at 90 degrees. This is just going toward closer to 180. So it's still the same practice. Um, it also uses mindfulness. The attention most times with the eyes closed is inside the body so you can really feel what happens over time rather than being distracted with what's outside the body or some idea of what you're supposed to be doing. You can be completely connected to what you're doing. And kind and compassionate <laughs> goes along with the non-striving. So. Yin tissues in the body. So connective tissue is yin tissue. Here's a whole list. Fascia, which is huge now. Everybody's talking about fascia in many different realms. Tendons, ligaments, joint capsule, meniscus, bursa, blood vessels, adipose tissue, even bones could be considered. They have connective tissue parts to them. The most important idea I want you to get from this slide with this wonderful depiction of the connective tissue system in the body is that it's all interlinked. It's not like, here's a muscle, here's a tendon, here's ligaments. There, one flows into the next, which flows into the next and the next, and they're all connected to each other. Um, so when you work connective tissue, like in the side of the right leg, you can follow it up. You also might be working connective tissue up in the left shoulder. So if you're working, if you're feeling stretch in this big band of fascia here, mm -hmm. It's connected to all the deeper connective tissue around the joint, the joint capsule, the ligaments, the tendons, all those things. So questions? This is my change slide picture. Okay. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> so we know we're working them. How does that work? Why does it work? So tendons, ligaments, cartilage, and gags. Um, I thought I had a Gags are in the um, ground substance around the cells. They're a glucose protein molecule that holds water. Um, don't ask me to say the chemical name. I thought I had it written down there, but that's what they are. How are they made? Well, they're made by fibroblasts, the purple um, ghost-looking things that are wrapped around the col blue collagen fibers. Those are fibroblasts. They manufacture collagen, elastin, reticular um, fibers, and the gags. They essentially make a matrix, in the, really in the shape of your body. So every muscle, every nerve cell, every organ, is coated and infused with connective tissue. If we took your body, this is kind of disgusting, and dumped it in a vat of some kind of solution that dissolved the muscles and the organs, if we, and then we pulled you out and hung you up, it would still look like you. It is the largest organ in the body. Okay, next one. <laughs> 
So to keep the connective tissue healthy, it needs stress, just like every other tissue. If you don't work your muscles, they atrophy. If you don't work your connective tissue, it atrophies. So just a qualifier at the beginning, so I don't forget to tell you this, yin yoga is not the only way to work connective tissue. It's just the yoga way, and I think it's very effective. So do you guys want to try this? So let's stand up and participate. So we're going to just do a forward fold. If you stand with your feet about hip distance apart, let your knees bend, and then walk your hands down either to your shins or they might be the floor. Don't try to straighten your legs. If it's hard to do that, you can put your hands on the chair, let your head go, feel. And sometimes we ask ourselves questions, where do I feel? If this is your first time, you might just say, oh, it's everywhere. What does it feel like? And you don't have to describe it, just notice it. And, and no moving around, nope, stillness. <laughs> what does it feel like? We want it to be mild. So if you're above a 5 out of 10, don't bend down so far. What stops me? So do you feel stretches, that's what's stopping you? Or do you feel pinching? That would not be a great thing. Or did I get all the way to the floor on my palms and I just can't go any farther because the floor is there? Some people are that flexible. Try a deep breath in and breathe out. I'm trying to keep you here like two minutes. If you're shaking, again, you might be going too far because we're very good at yang in our society. Farther's better. <laughs> so if you would, bend your knees and very, very slowly find your way up to standing. So with bent knees, bent knees, bent knees. I'm going to say it till everyone's knees are bent. There we go. I teach yoga. You might have noticed that. <laughs> So not only then, but now. Unless you're going to fall over, let your eyelids be heavy, close your eyes, notice what it feels like now. And not only that, check out how you feel tomorrow. Because in my experience in yoga practice, sometimes it feels good doing it. It feels good right after but you feel crappy tomorrow because maybe you pushed too hard or did the wrong thing or, you know, your ego's not in there, there anymore. <laughs> so go ahead and have a seat. Any questions or comments about that little extra? All good? Did it feel good? So if it feel good, say, I. I. Awesome. Okay. We'll go to the next one. We're going to get the sciencey part here in just a bit. So unstressed yin tissue because of aging or sedentary lifestyle, which a lot of studies are showing that it's not aging that's the problem. It's as we age, we get more sedentary. It's like a snowball. Um, dry, brittle, contracted, prone to injury, inflammation, stiffness. It's painful. Fascia is full of nerves. Um, it, the contraction decreases the space in joints, which causes arthritis and more inflammation. So, what kind of stress does yin tissue need? We kind of did that here. Tension or compression. So massage, or some of our yin poses, like we sit our hamstrings on our calves, or... In this pose, your abdomen might have been pressing against your thighs. That's compression. So tension or compression, we know tension in the yoga world as stretch. But connective tissue doesn't necessarily stretch. Fascia does. We don't really want to stretch tendons and ligaments. We just want to strain them. Um, gentle. In our regular yoga practice, we only hold stretches for 30 seconds to a minute in general. So we can be up in the you know, six, eight realm of stretch intensity and be safe. But in yin, we're holding it for one to five minutes. 
So we really want to be down in the two to five realm, usually two to four, I say. Less is actually better. Less intensity is better. You can say that to yourself 10 times. Less intensity is better. Um, it, the, t the body reacts to it better. It relaxes. Um, you won't tear a ligament <laughs> or a tendon. That wouldn't be good. Um, and you want to come back and do it again. You don't want to create a version to a practice that's helpful. The focus, again, in yin isn't on the shape you make, it's on the sensation. So this we call, um, the names of the poses are different because the intention is different even though they look the same. You might know this as sphinx pose or cobra pose. In yin we call it seal pose. And um, you may feel stretch in the front of the body here, but what we're really after is compression in the low back. So enough that you feel that feeling you wouldn't want to feel in your regular yoga practice, no pinching though. So pinching means there's tissue caught between bones and you're pinching it. That would be trauma. So for her, that's where she feels it. For many people, it's going to be much lower to the floor. So everyone will look different. Legs are nice and wide. And you might see a little smile on her. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> And we'll go one more slide. Oh, I thought I should throw something funny in here. We're gonna do some, we're gonna do some studies here, so I thought we should laugh first. There was a typo in my previous email. It should, of course, read, please focus completely on genome research. And he says, oh, I've already started this gnome research, okay. <laughs> Have you guys all seen this before? <laughs> okay, moving on. So I'm going to start with kind of a general thing. Back in 2007, the first Congress on fascia happened at Harvard Medical School in Boston. And these were the things that came out of that conference. And these were the two of the main researchers. Um, fascia moves. It can contract and relax. That was news to me. I knew it could relax. I didn't know it on its own could contract. Some of the fibroblasts are myofibroblasts. So they can actually contract the tissue. And um, guess what makes it contract most of the time? Stress. Stress and a room that's too cold, maybe. I mean, I'm not cold, but you might be. <laughs> yeah, cold, but stress is a big factor. And um, in my experience, it tends to correct, to contract around places in your body you've been injured before. Like, that's like a hot spot. I have a, a shoulder that's named after my youngest son. <laughs> like, if the shoulder starts hurting, I'm like, OK, what's bothering you? You may not even know something's bothering you until your body goes, something's bothering you, because look, your shoulder hurts. OK. It's also interspersed with nerves and pain receptors. It is the largest pain organ in the body. It reacts to what it feels. OK. Yes, please. <laughs> so key players we have. Fibroblast cells are manufacturers and always listening. listening. Collagen fibers are more plastic. Elastin fibers are more elastic. Gag molecules, oh, there it is, glucosaminoglycans. Did I do pretty good? <laughs> Protein chains that love water. Um, there's also hyaluronic acid. Uh, I researched this online a lot. I don't think fibroblasts make hyaluronic acid, but it is in the ground substance. They manufacture these on perceived need. They can actually migrate, migrate around and proliferate at the needed site. <coughs> Boom. Next slide. When, when you said that on the last slide that the collagen was more plastic, what do you mean by that? Plastic means um, like the lid of a Pringles can. If you try to pull it, if you pulled it hard enough, it would tear or elongate, and it won't go back together. 
Yeah. As elastic, you know what elastic, like a rubber band. Yeah. And a lot of tissues are made of a combination of both, but the more stiff, fibrous -y ones have more collagen and less elastin. Yes. So we've already talked about compression, tensile force, stretch or pull. There's also shear. You guys remember Indian sunburn, you know, the neighbor kid gave you or your brother or whatever? Yeah, that would be like shear. That he was just giving you some um, fascia treatment there. It's all good. <laughs> Okay, next slide. So, this is one of my favorite studies, and you'll see why in just a few minutes. Um, this group of people at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital did a study in 2012 where they um, injected poor little rats in the upper, lower back around just above their hip with um, this carrageenan. It's a it causes inflammation. It's a chemical that causes inflammation. Um, and then 48 hours after the injection, half of the my, uh, rats were treated with stretch for 10 minutes, two times a day for two weeks. The control group got no treatment. Poor babies. So the control group, uh, pain to touch, a limp, and the treated group, the pain dissipated very quickly, and they never developed a limp. Can you jump to the next slide real quick? We're going to go back and forth a couple times, because it's pretty funny. <laughs> this is a poor little rat hanging by its tail. So someone discovered they do this a lot, apparently. If you hang the rat by his tail, he automatically does like a downward dog kind of maneuver. In one picture, he's holding a bar, and with time, they don't struggle or resist this at all. I, apparently, they like it. And there's me hanging from the aerial apparatus, like downward dog. Do we look similar? <laughs> it feels really good. I, I'm not sure I could stay there for 10 minutes, maybe two minutes. Um, so go back again. So they did a second study in 2015 using approximately the same thing. And then they actually studied the tissues and they found markers of inflammation is RVD1. I, I don't know what that is, but it's a marker for inflammation. Much decreased in the treatment group. And neutrophils increased in the treatment group. So that was lowering inflammation. So um, this is not proof that stretching <laughs> lowers inflammation, but it points in that direction. Just lowering pain is awesome, right? So jump to the next one again. I, I wanna, we're gonna come back to this slide near the end because I have a little bit of an issue with this being only because of stretch, because there's some other issues if you know yoga and the body that could be going on here besides the stretch. And maybe that's a combination of things happening, and maybe it's just the stretch, and maybe it's not. So onward. So here is a study. Um, this one is in Japan in 2015. This was a very small sampling. I think there were 16 men, and this, so there was eight and eight. But all participants in the group were healthy middle-aged men. They gave an age range. Um, so they didn't have high blood pressure or other medical problems at all. They were given uh, five stretch sessions per week for four weeks. The control group was asked to not change their activity at all. They used this pulse wave velocity, which is a known measure to index arterial stiffness. So they measured both before and after in the control group and in the study group. And the, there was a significant decrease in arterial stiffness after the four weeks of stretch practice. 
which is a predictor of arterial disease. So lowering the arterial stiffness would lower the chances of arterial disease, high blood pressure, those kind of things. This was in their, what do you call that summary at the end? Short-term regular stretching induces significant reduction in arterial stiffness in middle-aged men. So I don't know if you're younger or older, if it will or not, but I think they pick middle-aged because there's less chance of already having disease. Yeah, they didn't pick women either because we're more complicated. So anyway, that was that one. For we, no, 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 yes. So let's move to the next one. So most of these have to do with stretching and the effects in the body. So um, cancer, there is some research being done on stretching and cancer in certain places because of its potential to reduce inflammation that we already know that has to do with the immune system. So this is the same <laughs> group that did the mouse study. So what they did this time, uh, the rat study, is they injected uh, mouse, mouse or rat, I, this says mouse, mammary area with breast cancer cells. So they gave the, the poor rodents uh, breast cancer. Then they administered a protocol of a 10 minute stretch, two times daily for four weeks, same protocol. So this reduced the tumor both volume and weight by 53% compared to the control group. Um, so this data suggests that stretching may impact two potentially related mechanisms re relevant to cancer, both immune cell exhaustion and inflammation resolution. If I was a cancer researcher, I could probably say that really fast, but more detailed studies are planned. It's like all of these studies point in a direction, but none of them are definitive. Okay, next one. So that was about the stretching part of yin yoga. This next section has to do with the more meditative part and the breath part of yin yoga, and then also the position of the body. So the vagus nerve, key to calm, part of the central nervous system, the 10th cranial nerve, part of the autonomic nervous system. It happens automatically. It's not in your conscious control. It is the key component of the parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest system, as opposed to where we're, some of us are caught in the fight or flight and don't even know it. We just know that we don't feel good. It is the longest nerve in the central nervous system. Vagus means wandering in Latin. So you can see it comes down from the brain. It actually has some branches that go like this. I'll tell you about this in a little bit. <laughs> um, communicates between the brain and the body. It has both motor and sensory. So it's listening and it's telling back and forth. Um, it communicates with pretty much every organ in the body. You can see it goes all the way down to your bladder and your rectum. It gets the kidneys a lot in the colon. This is your colon right here. So, you know, the first thing that happens when we get fight or flight. Um, it's monumental in reducing effects of stress. It has both sensory and motor functions. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about these things up here because it's not in any other slide. And this is one thing that I discovered that I thought was extremely interesting. They're on the corners of your mouth. So close your eyes, slightly lift the corners of your mouth and see how that feels. And then you can leave them up if you want <laughs> and then open your eyes. So it's listening. So these are sensory as well as motor, right? It's listening. If you're lifting the corners of your mouth, it sends that signal to your brain that says, oh, they're happy. And the whole body says, oh, we're happy. Or at least not, uh, not sad, not stressed. I'm not stressed and the whole body follows suit. So that fake it till you make it thing is in your nervous system, use it. It's a good tool. 
Um, there's also these ones that see them sticking out the back of the head, so the back of the head is that way. Does anybody get tense right here? Uh, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> next slide. So vagus nerve stimulation is a huge thing in the medical community for several different diseases. There's also a huge amount of research in ways that you can stimulate the vagus nerve without a device or an implant, as in using your breath and your body, which we've been doing in yoga for 5,000 years, right? So vagus nerve stimulation activates the parasympathetic nervous system, lowers your heart rate, lowers your blood pressure. You can tell for sure it's working if you feel saliva in your mouth suddenly. Um, decreases inflammation. Increases gastrointestinal motility. That means your bowels will move more normally. Stops the stress response. I don't know if it stops it, but it decreases it. They don't, mm, it's complicated. <laughs> um, gives you a general sense of calm which includes better focus. So the test they use to determine tone of the vagus nerve, like is it able to respond the way it should, is called heart rate variability. And you can test it on yourself maybe. Sometimes I like testing it, and I'm like, I don't know if it is or not. So the way this works is if you know that exhaling lowers your heart rate because it activates the vagus nerve. Then when you exhale, your heart rate will slow down or your pulse rate will slow down. And when you inhale, your pulse rate will get slightly faster. If there's not much difference between the two, that means your vagus nerve um, could, could be working better. So we'll move on to the next slide. Here's one of my favorite little yogis. Um, so vagal nerve stimulation studies include breathing techniques, or in yoga we call them pranayama, as natural vagus nerve stimulation. So lengthen the exhale. You can do counting, like inhale to two, exhale to four, or whatever variable. There's also mantra. There's uh, some studies that show that mantra helps because, like singing, it lengthens the exhale. Chandral breath. So chandra is the moon, and it's the yin side of your nervous system and brain. And it's the left nostril. So if you close the right nostril, and breathe only through the left. That would activate your vagus nerve, as long as you don't feel distressed. If it's hard to breathe through and you're getting distressed, well, of course, you're not activating it anymore. There's another breath called ujjayi breath, and you may have practiced that in yoga class. Sometimes we call it the Darth Vader breath. So. Yeah. Cooling breath. There's a study on shitali and shikari breath. These are breaths that are meant to cool, which is yin. Um, we don't do this in yin practice, but I just thought it was interesting. So shitali would be making a straw with your tongue, and not everyone can do that genetically, and breathing in through the straw. You press your cool tongue to the roof of your mouth as you breathe out. The other practice would be shikari breath, which would be so the teeth are together and you ohan the sides of your mouth and spit rolls and things feel cool and you close your mouth as you breathe out. Um, other things, chanting and singing. They make you breathe out longer than you breathe in. Um, humming, same thing. So off we go. Studies, I think, could be a surprise. <laughs> yes, please. So here's our pranayama studies. Physiological responses of yogic breathing techniques. This is 2011. Is this the right one? Oh, that was the breast cancer one. 
Wrong one. So these are all studies that had two groups. One was um, not given anything to do that was a practice other than usually just sitting there. Or sometimes they were told to control their breath, which didn't do any good either, because what's that mean anyway? Um, so for one hour of practice, this was done in <laughs> India. They're serious about their pranayama in India. Um, so they did the technique for one hour. And uh, heart rate and systolic, that's the top number in your blood pressure. Um, and the treatment group, group was significantly degree, decreased after the practice. So this tells us that the parasympathetic nervous system kicked in. They were much calmer. Um, honestly, I'd like to see it after maybe 15 or 20 minutes. An hour is a long time to expect someone in our society to do breathing practice. Um, and then there's the effects of the Shitali and Shitkari uh, practice. This was also, is this the one with the pictures? Yeah, there's a picture of an Indian gentleman doing the practice. Um, So these were a little bit more realistic. 10 minutes of practice for 30 days. Decreased heart rate and um, systolic blood pressure greater than 5 millimeters of mercury in hypertension subjects. So these subjects actually had high blood pressure. Um, heart rate variability was also measured. That's the thing that measures um, with your breath, what your, if you have a well-toned uh, vagus nerve. It wasn't definitive. It's really hard. <laughs> there are actually little devices you can put on now that measure your heart rate variability. You know, where, wherever there's something someone wants to know, there's someone who's willing to let you buy something to figure it out. <laughs> uh, I sort of like the devil's advocate. I think in today's society, if you could get anyone to sit for an hour and do nothing, their heart rate and their blood pressure would go down. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that, that you're like me. We're going to go back to that other picture of the, because I'm like me, I'm like, well, I don't know if it was only the stretch. <laughs> um, so more studies are needed on all of these. Um, let me see what the next one is. I can't remember. Yeah, so go back to the, go back to the, um, the mouse hanging or the rat hanging upside down. So inversions activate your vagus nerve. Did you notice anything about me and the rat? We're upside down. The other thing that activates the neck vagus nerve is opening the chest and extending the spine. Did you notice anything about, well, I'm not sure about the rat's chest, but I know for sure mine. In the real study, they have the rat holding onto this bar out here with his little paws. So were the results because of the stretch or were the results because they were in an inversion with their chest open and it activated the vagus nerve? That's my question. Either way, it's yoga practice, <laughs> which is which I'm not sure. So let's go back to the last one. That was the shitali breath. How much time we got? I think there's a, there's a, there. oh, we're doing good. So we have meditative practice effects, sitting still, doing nothing. Yes, when you're in a five minutes holding a pose that's mildly annoying, that's what I tell students, if it hurts, you're in the wrong place. If it's mildly annoying, stay there. It will create lots of patience. <laughs> so um, this study titled The Breath of Life, the Respiratory Vagal Stimulation Mode of Contemplative Activity. I don't know, is contemplation an activity? Most of my contemplative practice is lack of activity. <laughs> but, um, so the proposed 
of the study is that neurophysiological model that explains how these specific respiratory styles could operate, but basically and tonically stimulating the vagal nerve or the respiratory vagal nerve stimulation. There's actually a little thing for that, like. So contemplative practice includes breathing practices and meditation, mindfulness, whatever kind of meditation they were taught, let me think. Oh, this is a compilation study, and that's why I can't think what was done. So this is actually, it's very thick, a review of many other studies smushed together. So the positive effects of meditative practices, lower blood pressure, heart rate, lipid profile, anti-inflammation, as in a decreased C-reactive protein that they measured, decrease, or excuse me, increase bone density, and balance and flexibility. Mental health benefits, stress relief by subjective and objective findings both, decreased cortisol and inflammatory markers as well as subjects probably filling out a survey and telling how they felt. Um, a decrease in affective psycho psychopathology such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Also, under the cognitive performance realm, we have an increase in executive function and working memory, improved attentional control, and enhanced creativity. So that was a huge like, compilation study there. OK, what's next? So this last one. <laughs> Um, yoga poses increase subjective energy and state self-esteem in comparison to power pose. Does anybody know what we mean by power pose? So there's a study several years ago, like the Superman pose or Superwoman pose makes you feel powerful. Um, I already know from a study that I read probably 10 years ago that this right here, if you hold it for a minute, will actually increase the testosterone in flow in your body. So um, that alone will make you feel better. So these ladies in um, England wanted to compare the results that they got from those studies with actual yoga poses. So the yoga pose they used was mountain pose. Oh, I'll tell you after. So mountain pose here or here. And then part of the study was also poses that don't open the front of the body. So yoga pose like this. That was like a really sloppy uh, pose there. As opposed to, I think, I have to stand back here. This was one of the power poses. <laughs> so the power poses are things you might see all the white men in the room, you know, white man executive doing to create power over the room, people in the room. Yeah. <laughs> So those are power poses. They make you feel powerful, or they make you think other people are not as powerful. I don't know. So their whole thing was the poses in yoga do not have the psychological attributes that those poses do. Like Wonder Woman, um, they're more contemplative. So the results were any of the poses that close the front of the body had no change in results as far as energy state and self-esteem assessed. But um, the yoga poses that lifted the chest and opened the uh, chest and throat had equal results as the power poses. So their <clears throat> conclusion from that was that the position of the body was the key and not the psychological component of a, quotes, power pose. And this was a pretty good study, too. They had many ethnicities in the group. It was, um, there was like, uh, I want to say like 80 people. 
it was a university study, so they drag all the psych students in and they have to participate. <laughs> you were in that, that, like, you didn't even know you were in a study until somebody walks in the room and says, hey. <laughs> um, yeah, they didn't know they were in a study either. I mean, they knew they were in a study, but they always lie to you about what it is. <laughs> It's pretty interesting. Um, so these things are also associated in previous studies with vagal nerve stimulation, these attributes. So they didn't have to prove that. That's already been established. Questions about that one? Good. So what's next, please? Here it is, sorry, here's my graph. <laughs> so we have, um, on the left we have yoga closed front, yoga open front, power closed front, power open front. And you can see there was no, um, well basically, the open front ones have higher numbers, <laughs> that's what you wanna see. Those are baselines that haven't changed, yeah. Okay, one more. We're almost at the end. So there's me in a couple yoga poses that in yoga we would say stimulate the vagus nerve. So um, tall mountain pose with the chest lifted up out of the waist and fish pose. It's a little easier because the floor is holding you up. Yeah, in yin um, we would prop you up on something so you wouldn't have to hold that. And then one more. Would you like to experience this pose? Does anyone want to stand up and do mountain pose with me? So I have my hands clasped like this. You can do that or you can just have your hands up like this. If this hurts your shoulder, please widen your arms. <laughs> No, you're flat on your feet, yep. And actually feel your feet. Feel your breath. Be sure to exhale. If you want to raise the corners of your mouth, that'll help too. They had them hold it for a minute. And they videoed them to make sure. <laughs> and then lower your arms. So before you do anything else, stop and feel. All good. Anyone feel any calmer or centered or any of those things we talked about? Yeah. Mountain pose is one of the simplest poses you can do, and it's one of my favorites. It is. I'll just standing there. Just go and I'll reach up. Mm -hmm. That just makes me feel good. Yep. The basic poses. I don't do anything but the basic poses anymore. <laughs> it's what you figure out after you've done yoga for 15 years. Oh, those basic poses are all I need. Okay. So one more. We're almost to the end. This is a study called the Yomi study. Yoga and mindfulness slammed together means Yomi. <laughs> I'm sorry, you all can sit down if you want. Um, so also in 2017. So participants in the study were either placed on hold, meaning they would get the study, um, uh, what do you call it? the stuff that they did later, like they weren't completely left out, they had a session for them to do Yomi also. So they had 90 minute sessions, 30 minutes, uh, the first 30 minutes was mindfulness training, and then the 60 minutes was yin style yoga. They did this two times a week for five weeks, and it wasn't at home, they actually came to a facility with a um, well-trained teacher They had decreased levels of stress and worry. 
increased perception of mindfulness, and in the five-week follow-up, retained most of the positive outcomes. They were encouraged to practice some at home, but it wasn't part of the curriculum. I don't know if you guys know about MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. There's like a six-week program you can go to on that, that you go once a week, and then you have homework for 45 minutes to an hour every day. Um, again, these were university students. They didn't want to burden them with the idea that they weren't participating enough or had to do that. And obviously, they didn't need to. Part of mindfulness training is that when you learn something that's experiential, it come, becomes part of your life. And so that's probably why the five-week follow-up retained that. So they weren't studying the inflammation or anything. They were just studying the effects on uh, mind, um, stress, and worry. So that was a pretty good study. It seems like the, uh, some of the positions hanging upside down, openness, if you see children playing, they do it naturally. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> they play, 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 and then they throw themselves on the ground, on the rest, and look around. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, yes, they do. Um, yeah, well, if you can. I said, oh, the playground playing. <laughs> Yes, please. This is the last slide. So you can be a yoga scientist also. You can use gentle stretches holding three to five minutes. Breathe with a focus on the exhale. Or you can hum every time you breathe out. <laughs> Watch what happens using compassion, curiosity, equanimity. What are the benefits? more relaxed and more energetic. That would be nice, right? Caffeine does not make me more relaxed and more energetic. It just makes me more energetic, uh, right? Um, less pain. I've been practicing yin yoga for only about a year this month, and I have much, I would say, decreased pain around my hips and low back by like 80%. And I practice yoga, regular yoga for a long time, stretching, or straining those tissues really, really helps. Um, low blood pressure? Lower, excuse me, you don't need low blood pressure, just lower blood pressure, <laughs> normal blood pressure. Decreased cardiovascular disease, less prone to injury, contentment, and confidence. I think that's it, is there any more? Ta-da! So, any questions? No, no, you're fine. I love questions. Yes, it's all exhale, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we do that in yoga too. <laughs> there are other breath works that they've studied, but I couldn't bring all of the studies because it would have taken. The other thing, since we have a couple minutes. I just want to repeat the question for the camera. She, um, Diane mentioned. No, that's okay. Um, we didn't realize. Um, you mentioned um, like Lamaze class, childbirth classes. They have that emphasis on the exhale. Mm -hmm got to be a connection. Right? Well, when you want the baby to come out, you need to let go. <laughs> and the exhale is the letting go breath. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to include in this talk some stuff about the, can what's it, the astrocannab, what's the cannabinoid system called? Uh, endocannabinoid. endocannabinoid system. But honestly, there's not really great research yet. Um, yoga influences this system also. Um, so a lot of these same practices activate that system. So anyway, I would look forward to seeing more research on that. It's the, it's the, I tried to hit like the big things in the, that's going on right now and in yoga. Yeah, I, I looked a little bit into that too. And, um, and it, what it seems to, to do is it has a physiological effect on you where it actually um, inhibits your sympathetic 
nervous system and it's through neurotransmitters. So I did, I was able to kind of figure that, but I got to tell you, that stuff is really hard to understand. It is really hard to understand. And I'm like, really so does it have to do with the vagus nerve? Are they in or I couldn't find anything that they communicated that much with each other, but there's a lot of I don't knows out there about that. So, yeah. Ying and yang are supposed to be balanced. Do you practice the yang? Do you do both uh, equal proportion? Long style yoga where you hold poses using the muscles. You can ride bicycles. You can swim. There's lots of things we can do. I go to the gym for walking because bugs love me. <laughs> <laughs> and I lift weights. So there's lots of things. We need it all. And as I said at the beginning, yin yoga is not the only way to keep your um, connective tissue healthy. There's massage. There's um, uh, acupuncture. There's jumping up and down is really good for your connective tissue. So you can do more of that. Old people like us, we don't jump up and down enough. So jump rope. Jump rope. Yep. That thing where you, I forget what it's called. You um, catch yourself on the wall and push off. That's really good. Um, so do all of those things, as many as you can. Anybody else? I did notice carrageenan was listed as an inflammatory. I see that in foods a lot, ingredients. Oh, is it really? It's a what? Well, there's lots of things we eat that you wouldn't want to inject in your muscle. So I don't know. I don't know that that's a bad thing to eat or not. I would have to investigate that more. I, I know what you're saying, Does it though. Does create inflammation when you eat it? Well, things that are caustic to inject in your body are not necessarily caustic to put in your... I'm not saying it is or isn't, but I would, it deserves some investigation. <laughs> yeah. Like... I drink lemonade, but I wouldn't want to inject it into my muscle. <laughs> yeah, I don't drink the nut milks that have that stuff in there just because I, I just want nut milk. They use it to make it feel like it's thicker than it is because there's hardly any nuts in there. I make my own nut milk from nuts. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that information. With us. Um, so again, thanks so much for coming out uh, again on another evening uh, for Citizen Science. We will be having another Citizen Science on November the twelfth, and um, November the twelfth, we are inviting members of the Ark of the Bay and they will be presenting their aquaponics project to us that was actually developed by a young woman and a Girl Scout. She kind of was the brainchild of this. And then they actually use it at the Ark of the Bay to train some of their um, clients and students um, in new jobs or um, sometimes maybe some challenges in their life that they need to overcome and maybe retrain for jobs. So they're actually growing herbs and using them in their culinary department and uh, also uh, Tzatziki's is also using them as well in their restaurants. Um, so we're gonna invite those folks out next month to tell us a little bit about their project. Um, but I do hope that you guys enjoyed Dawn's presentation tonight. I do wanna let you guys know that she really is one of my favorite yoga instructors of all time. Um, and uh, she, and if you would like to take classes from her, I do, from her, I would like to say that you can find her at Yoga Elements in downtown Carillon on Panama City Beach. It's a wonderful, wonderful studio, beautiful view of Lake Carillon, and, and as, as I've mentioned, um, very highly qualified teachers. Um, so thanks again very much for coming out. Just want to put in a plug yes. for yeah. uh, St. Andrew Bay Resource Management Association, RMA, uh, also known as Baywatch, if you're interested in getting out over the water or getting out over the beach and helping to uh, protect those natural resources, just go to type in St. Andrew Bay Watch and upload come either our Turtle Watch website or our Baywatch website and you can find more information. Thanks for coming. <laughs>